The simple answer to why I am a Christian is because I am compelled to faith by my very existence. I choose the Christian God, Yahweh, because the words of the Bible not only persuade me to glorify the Creator, but they accurately fit with the tangible and empirical world I observe around me. I see evil, pain, and sickness all around me in this world, and more importantly I see it in myself. If there is a pure, spotless, and holy God, it makes sense to me that he would want to rid his creation of all this evil. The Gospel, the Good News, tells the story of Jesus, the Christ, dying on the cross and paying for my sins, and then raising from the dead to conquer death. My story has some ups and downs, though. G.K. Chesterton says in the introduction to his book, Orthodoxy, I did try to find a heresy of my own, and when I had put the last touches to it, I discovered that it was orthodoxy. Like Chesterton, I decided to step out of what I had grown up in and search out for what was true, but in the end I discovered truth was more or less where I had started. I was born in 1979 to Christian parents whose lives were centered around their faith. They explained to me at a very early age who Jesus Christ is, and at the age of four, during bedtime prayers with mom, I asked Jesus into my heart. As a young kid, I had a very childlike faith and went to church every Sunday with my parents and my brother. At that age, I never struggled with faith, and I kind of saw Jesus as the ultimate superhero. I believe it was in my preteen years when my dad started what he called Bible time on Sunday or Saturday mornings on Saturday mornings, which was taking what he did on a daily basis and leading my brother and I through it. He would take turns with us reading a chapter of the Bible and then teaching us about it and asking us what we thought it meant. We would finish these times on our knees in prayer. Through these times I really grew in my knowledge and understanding of scripture, but more importantly in my relationship with the Lord. When I was in high school, a youth group from Kansas joined my youth group for some youth rallies and outreach. I remember at that time really making my faith my own. I had a choice whether or not to go to church, and I chose to go. Admittedly, a lot of the draw was the social aspect of youth group, which had become a circle of my closest friends. I remember, though, really feeling like Christ was the answer for the world and wanting to further the gospel somehow. The first real challenge to my faith came from chat rooms online. My interest in music, specifically electronic music, had merged with my newly bolstered faith, which led to my discovery of Christian music. Like a sponge, I soaked up info in Christian music. My subscription to CCM Magazine, that's Contemporary Christian Music Magazine, led me to their chat rooms about all things Christian music. In those chat rooms, people started showing up to bash Christians and make fun of us. These days we would call those trolls. Most of them were self-proclaimed atheists, and some of them actually started to pose some difficult questions to everyone in the room. I started to get frustrated with the other Christians because they usually gave silly answers or they evaded the question or ganged up on the atheist. I realized I did not want to be one of the Christians that could not answer their tough questions and started to wonder if they really had a point. The questions turned into nagging doubts that followed me into college, where my faith was challenged academically and logically in the classes I took. I remember professors teaching a humanistic and evolutionary point of view in biology, earth science, and even in English. I began to really question what I believed. I wondered if Christianity was based on myths, tradition, and wishful thinking. Maybe as cold as it sounded, science showed that everything really is just chance organization of molecules, and it only seems remarkable because it's somehow evolutionary advantageous to see it that way. Because of my doubts, it was easier to fall in with a group of friends whose sole aim in college was to party, get drunk, have sex, and get high. I didn't resent the way I was raised, but I felt like I had been sheltered and now I was free to experience what it felt like everyone else around me was doing. I can't remember how many times I got drunk that year and tried smoking weed on a few occasions. Throughout that first year of college, God began revealing so many holes in the logic of those atheistic and evolutionary arguments. I continued to argue with atheists in chat rooms and felt myself drifting toward the nihilism of accepting a godless universe, but then I started to see inconsistencies from my evolutionary professors. 
a guest lecturer in my earth science class was showing slides of his rafting trip through the Grand Canyon. As he marveled at what millions of years had carved through the rock, he pointed out one rock wall that clearly showed striations that geologists used to help date layers of rock. He said, here's a mysterious bit of rock. It seems to have millions of years of missing geologic material. See, one of the biggest things atheists always point out is that the Bible can't be true because of the young earth it seems to portray, and other things like how silly the story of Noah's flood sounds. I'd wrestled with points like that, and they were actually starting to unravel my belief in the Bible. But here was a proponent of evolution confounded by what seemed to me to be empirical evidence of a younger earth. Throughout that first year of college, God began revealing so many holes. Oh, I already read that part. Delete this. Later in Biology 101, I distinctly remember my professor telling us to turn to page such and such in our textbooks to see an example of a creature in stasis. The book showed a horseshoe crab that, quote, has amazingly been in stasis for millions of years. I kept thinking, okay, you can show me a photo of stasis, but nowhere in this book do I see an actual photo of a fossil of a creature in transition. The more I thought about the blind forces of evolution trying and trying until something worked, the more I thought there should be plenty of photos of these failed tries and in-between creatures. In fact, over millions of years, there should be a lot more of those than fossils of present-day animals, right? Another time I was in the shower of my dorms and I was asking God, God, if you're real, why don't you make yourself more clear? Why don't you just tell me audibly that you're real? If you're the most important thing in the universe, why is there even a question as to whether you're there? I feel like God gave me a vision, speaking to me subtly as he always does. It was me walking in a dark cave and just seeing the glow of his light around the next bend. Every time I got to the bend, he was just around the next one. I believe what he was trying to show me in this is that he leaves evidence of himself all around, but he wants me to keep following it to him. He wants me to trust him. If he were to appear in person, well, I would have no choice but to believe, and that's basically forcing me to choose him. He wants me to see his glory and choose him. Through the rest of college and many years after, I became more and more of a reader, and I was most intensely interested in books on creation science. Um, I will have a suggested reading list in the, in the description. From a scientific stance, these books did so much to bolster my faith and help me realize that science and empirical evidence back up the Bible more than any other book ever written. The writings of C.S. Lewis, G.K. Chesterton, Lee Strobel, Josh McDowell, John Ankerberg, Ravi Zacharias, Francis Schaeffer, and Soren Kierkegaard satisfied my growing philosophically curious mind. I knew I was rising above a lot of those around me in regards to apologetics when my church's youth pastor asked me to speak to the youth group on creation versus evolution. Later, I felt it was a little intellectually dishonest to pick a belief and only read everything that backs that belief. So I read some books to counter my beliefs, including The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin and God is Not Great by Christopher Hitchens, and my reviews will be in the description below. If you read my reviews of those books, you'll see why they don't change my mind. At some point not many years ago, I started to recognize that as fascinating as apologetics are, it is Christ who changes us, not good arguments. After wrestling with so many questions, I've realized that if my very existence and the living, functioning world and universe around me isn't enough, um, at some point not many years ago, I started to recognize that as fascinating as apologetics are, it is Christ who changes us, not good arguments. After wrestling with so many questions, I've realized that if my very existence and the living, functioning world and universe around me isn't proof enough that God is real, then there would be no way to prove it to myself or anyone else. I realized I wanted an answer to shut down any argument against Christianity, more to prove it to myself than to argue anyone else. 
Then one day I heard Andy Stanton. Then one day I heard Andy Stanley say something along the lines of, "Who among us feels like we have to know everything about an airplane and how it operates before we will get aboard?" No one. We all put our faith in the engineers who built the plane and the pilot flying it without knowing how the plane works. And this helped me to rest in the fact that I'll never be able to address any and every claim against Christianity. The Bible says Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness, which made me realize that God wants us to choose to have faith in him. He wants us, his creation, to use our free will to choose him. In those years of taking a hard look at my faith and the apologetical view, I often wondered if my four-year-old self really understood enough to really become a Christian at such an early age. But later I believe God reminded me of Matthew 18, 3 and 4, where Jesus says, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I truly believe the way to God is simple enough for a child or a simple-minded person, even though the depths of God are unsearchable and answer the most sophisticated questions. Many people's testimony about be- many people's testimony about coming to Christ is a dramatic story beginning with their former life of being deceived by the occult, dealing drugs, prostitution, etc., and then finding Jesus. I love these stories because you can see so vividly the contrast of Christ's redeeming power in their life. For me, the contrast isn't so stark. Having believed since I was a small child isn't so stark having believed since I was a small child. And this has made me somewhat blind to what Christ has done and is doing in my life all these years. But when I really start to examine my life, I clearly see the fruits of the Spirit that can't be attributed to my own power. So here's a few examples. One, love. God has taught me how to love not just my family and friends, but people who are maligned and poor in spirit, and even those who oppose and hate me. Joy. He's given me a deep joy, not just a passing happiness like you feel when your team wins big or you get to go to or you get to go on a vacation to the beach. Christ has given me a peace that passes all understanding. There's so many things in this world to worry about, but I feel like I have an overarching peace that transcends fear, anxiety, or the sadness of any given situation. Patience. Many times in life I'm very impatient, but at the times when I lean on the Holy Spirit, He helps me achieve patience. Kindness. I've been described as a kind person as far back as I can remember, and I realize that, again, this isn't my natural instinct, but God working in me. Goodness. I've seen God move me toward goodness, especially in the area of generosity. Having grown up in an extremely frugal household, I saw a big part of that was stinginess, and though God is still working on me in this, I've come to be more and more of a generous person. Also, there's a growing desire in me to sacrifice my time and energy to help the poor and serve others. Faithfulness. Another trait people often use to describe me as steadfast and loyal. Again, something that can only be caused by Christ in me. Gentleness. Though the world, specifically the male world, looks down on it, I've been a gentle person. Self-control. This is a sign of God at work in a person. Honestly... And honestly, this is one I have the most struggle with. With things like lust or eating or gossip, I find myself falling into these all the time. But this is where God shows himself powerful because even in the midst of these, if I'll only turn to God in that moment, I have the power to break free. The Christian life is fraught with battles. And contrary to what some people preach, everything doesn't get better and easier. I truly believe Satan steps up the steps up attacks the closer you're following Jesus. The enemy's most effective moves in my life have been busyness and just getting me so deep in daily routine, including church and church functions, that I'm numb to the spiritual matters, which really leads to unbelief. And so I continue to lean on the Holy Spirit as he draws me more and more near to him. The longer I'm a Christian, the more I start to see that all things, every little nuance of life really, fit together with the Bible and the gospel message. I've come up with some categories of the reasons I believe in God and and Jesus 
and I may add more as I think of them, but so far they are noetical, experiential, physical, historical, testamental, the Bible, and the failure of other belief systems. You can find more exhaustive categories like this in books like John Ankerberg's Ready with an Answer, but my intent here isn't to compile everything I could find arguing Christianity. My intent is to show you the things I've realized thinking about this on my own. I'll probably spend the rest of my life fleshing out these categories, but examples are as follows. Noetical. This term is pretty new to me, but philosopher William James explains, Noetic refers to the states of insight into deep depths of truth, unplumbed by the discursive intellect. They are illuminations, revelations, full of significance and importance, all inarticulate though they may remain, and as a rule they carry with them a curious sense of authority. So basically, things we can't measure scientifically, but know and experience, such as love. So, um, under noetical, one is a deep sense of purpose. I began to really realize this on days in my younger years when I didn't have a job and I wasn't involved in anything. Long days would pass in boredom, and it came to me that I must have been made for something much more than watching the days just go by. Also, I started to see that just about everyone I knew was really good at at least one thing, and that could usually be in some way applied to sharing Jesus or serving other people. For me, I saw that from the time I could hold a pencil, I had this insatiable desire to draw. This seems to really fit with Jesus' parable of the talents in Matthew 25, where it's pretty clear he's commending those in the story who do something with their talents. It's also interesting to note the etymology of the word talent. Number two under noetical is a deep sense of justice. I don't know when it dawned on me that the core um, of the plot of almost every book, movie, or story is the archetypal, is the archetypal, archetypal. I don't know when it dawned on me that the core of the plot of almost every book and movie and story is the archetypal, unlikely hero going against all odds to defeat some kind of bad guy, if not some kind of evil. So many of those stories are about vengeance. I, for one, get super amped to see the main character exacting revenge on the murderer who raped his wife and then killed his whole family. But in our warped world, sometimes you'll see the bad guy winning, and this got me to thinking about who decides who's the bad guy. Who really is right or wrong? And why should the good guy be the one we think he should be? This in turn makes me quite a bit hesitant to classify someone as a bad guy, especially when they're just as zealously painting my side as bad. Again, the Bible, speaking of God's wrath, fully addresses justice. Romans 12:19 says, "Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, "It is mine to avenge, I will repay," says the Lord." Um, number three under noetical is love. What is love? The concept pervades almost all of our creative endeavors, and I doubt there's a single person who has ever lived that would deny this thing exists. Yet you cannot see it under a microscope. There is no chemical, no sequence of proteins that makes it up. No firing of synapses causes it. But the feeling I get when I think of my closest family is as much proof to me of its, of its But the feeling I get when I think of my closest family is as much proof to me of its existence as my being able to observe and feel and hear and taste an apple. And then you read in the John and then you read in the Bible, 1 John 4, 8, God is love. And that God so loved the world that he sent his own son to die for us, John three sixteen. Number four under noetical is ontological. Admittedly, I've just barely been introduced to this concept, but it makes a lot of sense to me. I wrote a blog kind of dealing with this from the point of view of a being that had just come into existence and begins to question said existence. It's called the primary question. I'll put a link in the. I'll, I'll put a link in the description. All arguments and debates about origin aside, I feel it deep down that I owe my being to something higher, much higher than myself. 
When I say higher, I don't mean that if you measured the greatest intellectual representative of the human race and then multiplied that to get this being. I mean much higher, that so much higher that he transcends existence itself. I like this quote from the comedian and actor Tim Allen. I want a relationship with whoever built me. This is too much, too weird that it all happened by accident. Um, number five under noetical is the soul. You really have to ask yourself, what is a soul? It starts with really trying to think about what makes a person who they are. Like, what drives their personality? I notice that when I see a picture of a person before meeting them, I formulate a guess to how they act, sound, what they do, or even where. What they do, or even whether they're a warm person or a cold person. This is almost always completely changed after getting to know the person, and it, this even continues to change years and years into knowing them. My wife and I loved our firstborn so much that when our second boy came, we wondered if it was possible to love him as much. We got a little scared that even months after our second child was born, we still didn't quite feel the same about him. As the months passed, we felt our hearts start to catch up with the love we had of the firstborn, and we finally had the epiphany that it was because we didn't know the second child like we knew the first. The longer you know someone, the more of their uniqueness, their quirks, and little idiosyncrasies you start to see. Every little smile, every squeal, the way they walk, their fears, how they act in a crowd, and so on. Or have you seen the body of a dead loved one? Or have you seen the dead body of a loved one? You really have to experience it to truly understand that feeling that your loved one is absent from that body. Doesn't it seem like the soul is far greater than the sum of our parts? Can't you feel that it transcends the chemicals and electricity that keep its earthly vehicle moving? The next category is experiential. I see so many underlying principles in this world and how they're explained by a biblical understanding of existence. Um, one under experiential is fatherhood or parenthood in general. I see this in my relationship to my parents, and now that I am a father, so much about God's character makes sense to me in light of this. For example, when my oldest son was just beginning to walk, he would push around this little toy walker around the room. I would watch him plow into a shirt or some obstruction on the floor and get stuck. My first instinct was to snatch the problem object out of his way so he could continue. But I realized that if I left the thing there, he would start learning how to deal with the hardship and learn how to better maneuver and balance. A light went off in my head about the much bigger problems we face in life and why God sometimes seems like he never hears our prayers. God refers to himself many times in scripture as our heavenly father. And while this may be impossible to grasp for someone who was either abused or their father was never around, this makes perfect sense to me because I had a loving dad. I could list many more of these scenarios. Number two under experiential is um, self. Number two under experiential is selfishness leads to destruction. I think the older I get, the more I see God built us to serve Him by serving others, and so the opposite, serving ourselves, leads us away from chasing God. I've also noticed that once in a while, when I get exactly what I wanted so bad, it only shows that that thing doesn't fill my yearning, and leads me into depression. Uh, number three, uh, uh, number three under experiential is Jesus's slash the Bible's commands to lead life. When the Bible says something like "Do not be drunk with wine," to strive for the opposite only leads to, like it says, debauchery and also alcohol, debauchery and also alcoholism and a myriad of other bad choices and vomiting and other health issues. When Proverbs says it is to one's glory to overlook an offense, you see that in practice this steers you away from conflict in life. Uh, four under experiential is spiritual. This one's hard for me because even as a believer, this is where I'm most skeptical. So many times, though, I have prayed and asked for things and received them. One night when I lived alone in an apartment, I felt particularly... One night when I lived alone in, in an apartment... <laughs> One night when I lived alone in an apartment, I felt particularly spiritually oppressed. But when I called out, in Jesus' name, leave me alone, it all stopped immediately. 
I'll put that full story down in the link. <sighs> description. I'll put that full story down in the description. And number five under experiential is my own powerlessness over my sin. As someone raised in the church and who continues to this day, I, I can't point to a time in my life when all I did was sin and then I met Jesus. For lifelong Christians, our sin battles come and go. There are times when our walk with God is weak and we backslide, and then there are times when we truly trust in the Holy Spirit and experience victory over our sins. It's at the times when I've been pulled down by pornography or drinking, even stealing or breaking the law, that I realize how weak I am. Especially over the addictive sins, I realize that no matter how hard I try, I cannot get control over them on my own. Recognizing how much of a sinner I am, I realize my righteousness is like filthy rags. That's it. That's Isaiah 64, 6. And I too am a sinner just like everyone else. And one day I'm going to stand before a righteous God and tremble because of what I've done. The next category is physical and scientific. This goes back to my interest in creation science books. For me, the observable world around me is much more easily attributable to a God than to random chance over time. There are countless aspects to science that points to God, but I'll just list a few here. Um, I also like this verse, Romans 1.20, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. So number one under the physical scientific is God's fingerprints. George Washington Carver said, I love to think of nature as an unlimited broadcasting station through which God speaks to us every hour if we'll only tune in. And when I really look at nature and think about it, it's like coming into a room and seeing a coffee cup with steam rising out of it. You know someone has just been there. It's been said God's fingerprints are in everything. I wrote about this some years back in a blog called Reveal Yourself. I'll put the link in the description below. For example, on really hot days when the sun is beating down on my head, I'm thankful to be able to seek shade. But then I think about the tree giving me shade. Where is its shelter? And then I see how God's engineering is so much better than the roofs we build that provide shade but are deteriorated by the sun's heat and UV rays. The tree has a million little roofs all swaying in the wind so as not to take direct sunlight for too long. And even then they get rid of those in the fall and renew the whole thing for next summer. Um, number two under physical and scientific is entropy. Way before I knew the second law of thermodynamics, which states, in all energy exchanges, if no energy enters or leaves the system, the potential energy of the state will always be less than that of the initial state. I noticed that everything is always breaking, falling apart, running down, and that it seems like everything needs some kind of maintenance to keep it going. Most scientists agree the universe will end in a heat death when everything becomes the same temperature. When I look at the world around me, I see it winding down and falling apart, not evolving to a better state. This seems to fit right in with the Bible's story that all was created good in the beginning until sin and the curse came in and broke the world. Number three under physical scientific is the supersedent the supersedence of maker to his creation. Again, something I observe in real life all the time is that if there's a painting, there's a painter. If there's an engine, there's an engineer. If there's a building, there was an architect and contractors who built it. If there's a building, there's there was an architect and the contractors who built it. As any biologist, um, brain surgeon or neurosurgeon will tell you the organic computer in our skulls is far, far more advanced than any computer ever built. Well, Bill Gates said this, DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. So why is it hard at all to believe that whatever made me is at least as much beyond me as I am above a computer? Number four under physical and scientific is living metaphors. Something I've noticed in life, and I can't think of a better way to explain it, is what I call a living metaphor, meaning actual situations and relationships in our life seem to explain God's reasons for things and his relationship like a metaphor. 
I mentioned one of these earlier in experiential as fatherhood. Another one is, take for example, a dog who's wandered off and gotten himself in a tangle with a porcupine. Whimpering back home, his master has to hold him down and painfully yank out each and every quill. The dog lies there, heart pounding in terror as he is bewildered that his loving master is now adding to his pain. His limited brain cannot understand what the master knows. The quills will continue to cause pain or even become infected if they aren't removed. Thinking about thinking about a situation like this suddenly makes me realize the reason for just about any pain and suffering. God spells out everything we need to know in this life through his word. But thick-headed as I am, I still need to see it in real life before it suddenly makes sense to me. The next category is historical. Christianity's impact on the world. Historical. Uh, number one is Christianity's impact on the world. Secular, so secular society is always trying to erase or minimize how Christianity has shaped our world. But I keep coming across things that make me stop and wonder. How, if this was a cult being pe perpetuated by weak-minded people, did Christianity accomplish so much? For instance, the year that we still to this day identify ourselves as being and is based on the approximate birth of Jesus Christ. Time is divided into BC and AD, and as I write this, it is 2019 years on Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. I first heard in college my art history professor, professor? I first heard in college my art history professor saying that they're trying to change before Christ to BCE, which is before Common Era, and then CE for Common Era, which is laughable revisionist history because you still have to wonder what caused the divide. Speaking of art history, this is where I gained knowledge of art throughout the ages and was just in awe about how much of classic artwork is dedicated not only to Christianity such as the countless Adam and Eve painting, paintings like Mas Masaccio's, <laughs> not sure how you pronounce it, but specifically to this man Jesus, such as Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper and so on. I really cannot think of any religion, but specifically person, that has had so much literature and art dedicated to them in the entire known history of the world. Number two under historical is archaeology. Admittedly, I don't know a lot about this subject, but I do know they found scraps of the Bible throughout time, including the Dead Sea Scrolls, that show translations for centuries have maintained the material impeccably. Also, archaeologists have found and continue to find fragments and evidence that only back up the historicity of the Bible. Three under historical is etymology. Many words and phrases can be traced back to biblical roots. One time I was putting together a little talk about our God-given gifts for his service. I was basing it on Jesus' parable of the talents in Matthew 25. I had always read that scripture... I had always read that scripture thinking... No, no, no. I had always read that scripture knowing that talent was the name of a currency in those times. Little did I know, though, that the current word we use for being good at something can be traced back to this parable. The next category is testamental. Obviously, you can't believe something just because someone says it's true. In fact, atheists have come up with a little fake god called the Flying Spaghetti Monster to basically say, see, I can make up something too and say it's true and you must worship it. To illustrate, like Russell's teapot, that the burden of proof lies upon the person making unfalsifiable claims. People who choose to stand on this reasoning seem to put God on the same level of the Flying Spaghetti Monster or the teapot in orbit. They are willfully ignoring the fact that no one actually believes in those things, and the evidences for God are far, far more abundant. In addition to all the things I've already addressed, millions of people from every nation and time, all ages, sex, and race have wholeheartedly put faith in God and in Christ. Again, this alone doesn't prove Christianity, as the same can be said for many false religions. But I have read, watched, and heard the testimonies of countless people from every but I have read, watched, and heard the testimonies from countless people, from the very wise and intelligent to the very average. I've seen the tearful and heartfelt stories being told from those who turned from atheism, New Age, witchcraft, Satanism, and so on. 
Christian doctors, professors, and scientists are plentiful. The stories of people like Billy Graham, Corey Ten Boom, Francis of Assisi, Richard Warmbrand, who wrote the tortured for Richard Warmbrand, who wrote Tortured for Christ, and on and on and on. I'll put a link in the description below of a playlist I put together of of people's testimonies I found on YouTube. Um, so number one under testamental is missionaries. I've been on several short-term mission trips and have rubbed shoulders with people who have given up everything to reach people for Jesus. The YWAM teams that are making it possible for Homes of Hope to build houses in Mexico, the translators who guided us in Uganda and knew the Bible better than I did, the Huber family who started Igreja de Paz, which is spread all over Brazil and down to Sao Paulo, with Pastor Abe Huber and his brother Tim in Tokyo at, Nobri at Noborito Ecclesia, our translators in Haiti, Ray and Candace Ward's work with the Outpour Movement in Thailand, and so on. Uh, number two under testamental is unlikely converts. From the myriad of YouTube testimonies of people trying to disprove the Bible to people like Alice Cooper and Brian Head Welch from Corn, it shows me that God's power reaches down into the most heart of hearts and transforms people. The book Secret Thoughts of an Un Unlikely Convert by Rosaria Butterfield is a great example. Number three under testamental is martyrs. A martyr of any kind has to believe absolutely in what he dies for. So with the thousands upon thousands of Christian martyrs in history, they either had to be right or sufficiently brainwashed to be tortured in the most horrific ways imaginable. Many years ago, I read a book by DC Talk and Voice of the Martyrs called Jesus Freaks and recently listened to the audio book of Fox's Book of Martyrs. I know people have been martyred for other beliefs, but the sheer number who have let go of their life at the I know people who have been martyred for other beliefs and no, I don't know people. I know people have been martyred for other beliefs, but the sheer number of people who have let go of their life at the hands of the most vile and vicious adversaries has to make you curious as to what as to what was so compelling to them. Number four under testamental is friends and family. Lastly, the testament of my close friends and family shows me how Christ has influenced and changed them. Their stories of faith build a foundation I can stand on. The trustworthiness of someone you know and love carries as much weight in what they say as to the veracity of the claim. You may have one crazy religious uncle or even branch of the family, but when generations pass the gospel down and you can see the experience of the Christian life lived out in countless friends and family, it becomes apparent that what they believe has merit. The next category is biblical. The Bible is a mysterious book because although it was written over many years and from different authors, it is consistent with its overall message and amazingly points to Jesus from thousands of years before he was born. It contains numerous prophecies that have been fulfilled its wisdom is unrivaled. I could go on and on about the Bible, but its central message, Christ being crucified and risen to bring us back to God, is the most profound message ever claimed as truth. The character of Jesus is admired among non-Christians almost as much as among Christians. Philip Schaff once said, It would take more than a Jesus to invent a Jesus. And this seems to be true to me. People have been able to invent all kinds of heroes and superheroes through time, but not one who comes to culminate Jewish law to be fully human but live a sinless life, God's son but yet a servant, giving himself for all mankind, and on and on. If someone did sit down and write that character, he must, him he must himself have been Jesus, or God. Entire books have been written about the Bible and Jesus, and so I won't go on. Again, this is just my own astonishment over the Bible. Many people will say things like, how can you trust a book written by sheep herders thousands of years ago? Well, partly because that statement is just wrong, but also because I reject the idea that I reject the idea of dismissing something just because it is old. In fact, something that has survived millennia and in fact, something that has survived millennia has to be protected by God and contain some rock solid truth.
Also, C.S. Lewis coined the phrase chronological snobbery, which he explains as the uncritical acceptance of the intellectual climate common to our own age and the assumption that whatever has gone out of date is on the is on that account discredited and i find that our society rejects Christ and i find that much of our society rejects christianity on this basis my last cal- <laughs> my last category is the failure of other systems of belief who in the world has the time to fully investigate every possible belief system and then make a judgment to which is truth it's easier to throw them all out it's easier to throw them all out or just give them all a default <laughs> it's easier to throw them all out or just give them all a default of equal ground so beside being born in a christian home how can i be comfortable choosing christianity i started a few years ago to compile a list of the things in an ultimate world view or belief Psst, let's start that over i started I started a few years ago to compile a list of the things an ultimate worldview or belief should address, and that's in a blog called The Theory of Everything. I'll put the link in the description below. I personally believe Christianity is the most sound, all-encompassing explanation of everything I see and experience in this world. Several of the religions come close, but then they miss out on some things, usually dealing with the sin I realize in myself. If I were to sum up the world's religions, I would say they are various practices to either help you become a better person, to reach God by your good works, become God yourself, or more or less realize that you are God. Christianity maintains that I am the creation, and God is the creator who reached down and saved me by doing what I could not do on my own. So having shared this with you, I would like to invite you into a relationship with Jesus Christ, your creator and the one who has redeemed you. To become a Christian. Many evangelicals hand out tracts with a concise prayer, usually called the sinner's prayer, in which you, quote, ask Jesus into your heart. While I believe these are usually well-intentioned and indeed contain the correct verses and words for a prayer, I think it's easy to become a rote formula. I believe the very first step in becoming a Christian is coming to a full realization of the sin and brokenness before a holy and I believe the very first step in becoming a Christian is coming to a full realization of your sin and brokenness before a holy and omnipotent God. This isn't something you can really rush. You have to contemplate and realize how lost you are before you see the enormity of what Christ accomplished on the cross for you. And since this is all about a relationship with God, you need to confess to Him your sins and repent. These days the word repent has become Christianese, or even most Christians seem to think it simply means to be sorry. Repentance is the sorrow that comes from realizing God's way is right and you were wrong and changing your beliefs and attitudes to fall in line with Him. The next step is to really put your faith in Christ's atoning sacrifice and then believing that His resurrection from the dead conquered death and paid the price for your sin, which would have been eternal separation from Him a.k.a. hell. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. The third step is acknowledging him as Lord of your life and allowing him to give you his Holy Spirit to guide and comfort you in all you do for the rest of your life. And that's it. Nothing more. If you truly believe this, putting the Lord... If you truly believe this, putting the Lord on the throne in your life will change you and you'll begin to see the fruits of the Spirit. I urge you to then profess this faith I urge you to then profess this faith publicly by getting baptized. Um I mentioned a lot of books I've read in this post and um I have a suggested reading list. I have a suggested reading list in the description below. Thank you for listening. God bless. <laughs>